Welcome back to another episode of the KO Game Room. And for the first time on the show, and for tonight's review, I'd like to look at a classic handheld title for probably my favorite game on the entire system. That is, Wario Land for the original Nintendo Game Boy. This opening sequence just about says it all, and does a pretty good job reviewing the game on its own. Here, where we are introduced to Wario for the first time, he's seen viciously chasing a pirate ship in a dinghy. Iceberg? No. Land ho? Oh god, it's Wario. The duck doesn't know what to do. He's screaming bloody murder. He is terrified. And for good reason. Unlike the Mario games that came before, you are not controlling a hero in this one. Wario is unlike just about any other main character in video games that predates this one, and 100% opposite of any in-house Nintendo character that has ever walked from left to right. One day Wario was practicing being mean when he thought to himself, rumor has it that the pirates of Kitchen Island have stole- <sighs> One day Wario was practicing being mean? <laughs> Who is this monster? Roger Klotz? <laughs> I think it's safe to say that Wario is a bully, but who practices being mean? That has to be one of the funniest things that I've ever seen in a Nintendo instruction manual. It does make sense though. He's not on this adventure to save a princess. He's not on this adventure to stop an evil monster. He's only thinking of himself. This is business. After the events of Super Mario Land 2, Six Golden Coins, in which Wario makes his first appearance as a googly-eyed lunatic that somehow claimed Mario's castle as his own, Wario decides that he's going to have his very own castle, one that is so mighty that it would even make Mario green with envy. And to do this, he needs to find as much treasure as possible. Welcome to Kitchen Island. Kitchen Island Never at this point in time was there a Nintendo Overworld map that I didn't like, and perhaps it's the nostalgia talking, but this has to be one of my favorites. It is a relatively short and linear game, but Kitchen Island's various sections and the music played throughout are a perfect match for Wario's character. And while it wasn't completely uncommon for Nintendo games to have a general theme, such as Super Mario World where several areas of the map are named after food, and Super Mario Land 2, where the overworld map was entirely based off of the recollection of an acid trip, Wario Land nailed it perfectly with kitchen-themed names for all of its areas, and it's nicely topped off with a consistent pirate overtone throughout. Now I haven't mentioned it yet, but the game's full title is actually Wario Land Super Mario Land 3. I personally hate that this wonderful game had to have Mario's name in the title other than a brief cameo appearance at the end of the game, where Mario is seen taking the giant golden statue of Princess Toadstool, he is nowhere to be seen in this game. I realize that this is just a direct sequel for Wario's character from the previous game, but I still think it should have just been called Wario Land. It's a spin-off, and with that in mind, I wish that there had been a true sequel to the Mario Land games. They were both fun and fresh takes on the Mario universe, and it's sad that the elements of those games are all but extinct. Wario is a brute, pure and simple. Even in his normal form, he can perform a shoulder charge technique, with which he can destroy blocks and enemies. The face blocks contain coins, power-ups, and keys which Wario uses to open the various skull doors that lead to treasure. These doors are not always easy to find. A couple of them require that you do a little bit of backtracking, and others are just in strange locations. You are able to open the door so long as you have the key, but if you are small Wario, then you're going to have to turn back and find yourself a power-up, because the only way to open the treasure chest is to ram it. The power-ups that Wario will receive are fantastic. For starters, Wario is notorious for eating garlic and smelling like shit. And this is the game where that originates from. The garlic is the most common of power-ups in this game, and is similar to the mushrooms in the Mario games. The main difference is, if Wario is already normal size and he finds another piece of garlic, he turns into Bull Wario, where he can charge for longer distances, break blocks in one shot, perform a ground pound that paralyzes enemies and breaks blocks beneath, 
and with the horns on his helmet, he can even stick to the ceiling wherever he can reach it. You can also power up to Bull Wario by finding one of the bull pots lying about. There also exist other power-ups in this game such as the Dragon Pot. When equipped, Wario can breathe fire through his hat for a short time. This can break blocks and kill enemies. I find this upgrade particularly useful against the enemies and obstacles in water levels, just like the Fire Flower in Mario Counterparts. But my favorite power-up in the game is the Jet Pot. When equipped, the Jet Pot gives Wario the ability to fly in a straight line for a long distance, allowing for easy passage over difficult terrain, but also necessary for finding at least one secret exit. Wario also walks much faster while wearing his jet hat. You eventually become spoiled and get used to it. And it's not really a problem, but when you eventually lose this power-up, the entire game seems to come to a crawl. So you make your way through the island enjoying all of the scenery, with the gradual increases in difficulty, being confronted by an area boss at the end of each section, some more amusing than others. It starts innocently enough on Rice Beach when you first reach a pretty generic looking spiked Koopa. Very easy to defeat. Then you have this penguin boxer at the end of Sherbert Land. He is pretty difficult at first, but then you realize that there is literally an exit door right on the fighting plane. I wonder if the developers thought it was too difficult and decided to offer an easy way out. My personal favorite of any of these bosses must be the angry face that fires snot rockets at you. Wario picks up his nasty hard boogers and just throws them right back. Also I just found out his name is Fun Fun? I wish there was some sort of a story behind these guys, but the instruction manual sheds no light on the subject. That's when I turn to the internet. On Mario Wiki, there is a list of all the silly names for these bosses, as well as a brief description of their attacks, but still no story as to where they came from. So yeah, despite all the weird Japanese names, all of these guys are easy enough once you figure them out. And finally, after defeating uh, Zen... Zenisu... Zenisu... or the Ghost at the end of Parsley Woods, you're finally faced with your final task, invading Syrup Castle. When I was a kid, this section was pretty intimidating to me. The first time I made it here, and looked at the massive Skull Fortress, I noticed the distortion in the image. It was as if the castle was emitting some sort of an intense heat, and the music only intensified the atmosphere. This is a great section to end the game with. There is more puzzle solving than in previous areas, and the difficulty of platforming has been substantially increased. With every level beaten, some of the castle's walls are blown away. I always enjoyed this effect. Even though the final form of it is little more than a pillar with a structure at the top, it's still very satisfying to be rewarded with this after each level. Now you've made it to the top, and it's the 40th and final course of the game. What is an otherwise simple and easy level to manage is a test to the player's will to resist their greed. I know that if I were to avoid the coins that I'd easily make it to the boss on my first attempt, but I always end up going for the loot and paying for it at least a few times. After a short encounter with a knight that guards the door, you enter the last chamber of the game and finally confront Captain Syrup. She's the captain and leader of the Brown Sugar Pirates and is known world over for being a really rotten and ruthless guy. Now I've played all of these Wario Land games many times over, and it wasn't until the making of this video that I noticed in the instruction manual that they refer to her as a guy. Even at a young age, I always thought she looked like a girl. Anyways, this is the final battle of the game. Captain Syrup uses the magical lamp to summon a large and powerful genie to do her fighting for her. Here you must toss the lamp that was left on the ground until it lands upright. It will produce a cloud for Wario to ride to a high enough point where he can jump on the head of the genie. This is to be done all while avoiding his projectiles and miniature versions of himself. After enough hits to the head, the genie is defeated, leaving Captain Syrup on her own. Literally fuming mad, the captain makes a hasty retreat, but not before leaving Wario with a parting gift. The bomb blows, destroying the remainder of the castle and Wario barely makes his escape. With the core of the castle now destroyed, it reveals the giant golden statue of Princess Toadstool. Remember when I mentioned Mario's little cameo earlier? After all of your hard work, surely that statue of the princess would be more than enough to earn Wario the castle he's been dreaming of. 
but before you can admire it for long, Mario casually putts in with a helicopter to take the prize. That asshole even waves at you as he claims the statue for himself. Wario watches as Mario flies off into the distance, and then he simply shrugs it off. No matter. With Wario in possession of the magical lamp, he summons the genie, who grants him one wish. Wario wishes for a castle, and the genie then explains that he requires cash? Pretty lousy genie if you ask me. But without so much as a doubt, Wario proceeds to liquefy his entire savings into giant bags of cash to give to the genie. And believe me, if you have all of the treasures and lots of coins, this process takes forever. After it's all said and done, he hands over the loot sacks and the genie just throws them over his shoulder. He then waves his hands a few times and points Wario to his new home. In this run of the game, I got the castle, which I always believed was the best possible ending to the game because hey, that is what Wario was after, wasn't it? Well, I was doing some research on this game after playing it again, and it turns out, if you clear 99,999 coins, get all the treasures, and beat all 40 courses, you are awarded with your own planet, with your face marked on the side. Well, that does suck. But things, they could have been worse. Among the possible endings are Wario being awarded with a pagoda, or a log cabin, a tree trunk, and even a tiny birdhouse. Imagine getting through the game to see one of these at the end. I still think the tree trunk is the funniest of them all. Well, I'd say that just about wraps up Wario Land for the Game Boy. I really cannot recommend this game enough. Wario games have always been the undertow to the more popular Mario titles, and it's a shame because they offer a unique glimpse into the world of one of the most underappreciated characters in Nintendo's lineup. Released in 1994 for the Nintendo Game Boy, that's Wario Land. Thank you for watching this episode of the KO Game Room, and I will see you all next time.